you wind up losing things like the little dry cleaner or something like that. You know, all the infrastructure the people who live there need wind up evaporating and getting replaced with restaurants and cupcake shops and all sorts of things well, which are not well, really that, and and yeah, in this specific case thing, and, I, right? and I, this is going to be different in different locations in this right. specific case jersey city is going through a massive gentrification process to start with Absolutely. right the reason yep. that people are referring to it as the seventh borough is because nobody can afford to live in Manhattan, and they're be, they've begun right. to get seriously priced out of Hoboken. So suddenly, Jersey City is the affordable place. I mean, soon, I have a friend who has a, who lives in an apartment there. Well, I have From, a friend who has an apartment there. His building was the tallest building in town when he moved in two and a half years ago, and there are four places within three blocks of where he lived that will be taller. Yeah. By 20, the end of 2020. That's like Nashville right now. Nashville is amazing. Like, correct. Right. Like, right. We spent a couple of right. months. Right. You're like, this isn't the same city. Correct. And the cost, the cost of urban sprawl is mm-hmm. is burdensome. Right. I mean, well, when you talk right. about oh. if the the further you push out the important people to uh, make an economy happen, uh, the more you then have to spend on transportation solutions. And uh, Billy, where do you live? Phoenix. And yeah, we're we're so we're thinking of urban yeah. sprawl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no kidding. We are one of the. Unless there's no point to say, "Hey, doing these days?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> soon I'm Phoenix so will be a commuter, commuter town to New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, that's the point. No, but I think yeah. it's absolutely a fair point. I mean, this is a silly little anecdote to go along with that, but I live way in West Phoenix, right, and kind of. You would say that central Phoenix is kind of contained with the 101 loop. All of our highways are loops around the city. None of them like to go through the city except the 10 for whatever reason. So it consolidates the traffic really nicely. Yeah, theoretically. (laughs) So if if we want to go up to Flagstaff, right, we take the 10 to the 101 and we have to go up to the 17, which is all well and good, except from the 10 to the 101, the on-ramp is one lane. And on our slowest day of traffic, there is a half mile backup because of how much people have to slow down to get on that on ramp because they didn't plan properly for the expansion. And now there's not a lot they can do about it. I mean, this on ramp goes away over other highways and everything. There's not a lot that they can do to rectify it. And it really creates a bottleneck from a transportation standpoint. So I think that another thing we're running into and to your point about transportation is that cities aren't necessarily planning ahead for it. They don't have the vision or the foresight about what might happen. With or, or, the, or the willingness of the tax base to support exactly. what they ought to be yeah. doing in well, the first place. Well, so, I mean, there's, there's, being constructed right now. I think the tax base is, is there for transportation. For well, you say that, that, except Orlando's redoing most of its infrastructure over the last uh, 10 years it started, and it's continuing into the next five years. And it's one of the largest uh, budgeted for a central location. Uh, it was something like seventeen billion dollars spent in infrastructure, That's and fantastic. and it's mostly road expansion. Right, uh, right. Uh, you know, uh, I four, which goes, you know, which really goes <laughs> right through the middle, um, and is really the only way to get around uh, for the longest time was the same footprint it had been since the seventies uh, right. until you yeah. got down into the tourism area. Well, the problem is, is People are going to Daytona now and people are going to other places uh, and people are living further out. And so it, it, you know, it is one of those things that if you don't plan correctly and if you don't have the correct laws in place to stop artificial uh, uh, push, you know, so Airbnb is that problem. Airbnb right, creates right. an artificial uh, speeding of pushing people further and further out because they cannot afford to live in the center, um, right. you you then end up with billion-dollar problems and multi-billion-dollar problems. So it is better to get in front of it. And even if it's a blunt instrument to start, that maybe creates a little bit of pain for people who are caught in the edges, uh, you, you really should be backing, uh, controlling it. Uh, because okay, otherwise, fine. I'll vote well, for against the bill. <laughs> well, I know no, the, the, yeah, the, the challenge Stewart a lot. I know this pain is Stewart a lot because we are talking about Airbnb. But I will say to some degree because I think when you were talking about this Key West is his prime example. Barcelona, another great example of 
over tourism, where it is, uh, there is a, it's it almost a victimless crime where you talk about the laundromats that no longer exist. And now there's trinkets and bubble shops because cruise ships come in and destroyed Key West, you know, that the entire island is within walking distance of everybody that piles off the boat. So the entire island is geared to every four hours, a wave of people wanting to buy stuff. So right. the infrastructure of the localization of it, the people that want to go to a laundromat or have meet a laundromat aren't there anymore. They, they literally are priced out. And the owners of the property, they're not a victim. The people that are renting it, they're not a victim. They're making the money off it, whatever it is. There's, there's almost a victimless crime, except for the culture of it that Key West is now faced with the fact that they get hit a roadblock that, uh, the, the environment is that they're not going to expand the, the channel to get to Key West so the megala megala boats can get there now. Only the still moderate size older boats, which eventually will no longer still be in service, are the only ones that still fit into the canal. So, Eventually, two, one of two things are going to happen. Either Key West is going to have to go against environmentalist people and dig up a bunch of coral so the big boats can come in, or they have to come back to a sustained localized economy without the tourism boats anymore. I don't know right. which way it's going to go, but I imagine with the Airbnb Thanks. conversation, it's a precursor to I can't build a big hotel, but I can rent the bejesus out of a small little building. And that kind of is, a, you know, maybe in a strange way, this is a way of getting off of some of the over-tourism in some of the smaller markets where the Airbnb is kind of the precursor to creating that tourism economy without having to build Marriott oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> but but again the the big loser is is um education systems, right? Because you don't have anybody with children and then you don't have schools and it's it's a horrible, horrible you know situation. So um these laws require you know maximum durations of stays or different you know there's numbers of days that can be rented. Um, it's well, Key West really has complicated a, stuff. A Twenty that, drink yeah. minimum in their mm-hmm. tax. Right? <laughs> yeah. But 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 they want to be very clear. But they want to be very clear. Well, there's but but let's be fair. They don't put a duration on that. If you want to do that all in fifteen minutes, exactly. you are right. free to do so. <laughs> free to do so. That's more <laughs> Panama City. City beat than that's heavy, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was that's that? more PCB. PCB is a little bit more along that line. So. <laughs> you know, yeah, but you know, one of the biggest businesses in Keys is the busing business because nobody can afford to live in the Keys, but the staff still need to show up. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Oh, sure. Oh, everybody else. The buses sure. come down. I mean, you walked. What, look at the, the one coming down. There's bus after bus because <laughs> people can't live. They had to actually put a limit as to how many people can live in a domicile of 15 per uh, per room because they had bunk beds for people. They were just changing cycles. They would go work and shift, and they come back and crash in a bunk bed and go back and work and shift. It's it's insane that the the density problem. That wait a second, there. wait a second. You're worried about the poor? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking politics here, Lauren. There's no room yeah. about the poor. They do not <laughs> donate much to campaign. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry, well, Lily, you were trying to get a word in edgewise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, speaking of uh, sharing rooms, have you guys seen Super 8's new room concept? I know it's not officially on our list today, but – Curious if you yeah room, that roommate all. roommate I'm going to talk about this a little because I think it's and I never talk about Wyndham stuff uh, Lily <laughs> I think you know this everybody else knows this for sure my wife works for Wyndham so I'm I try to keep you know a separation of church and state however I actually sent an email to the to the president of Super Eight who's a friend of mine the other day because uh, I think it's a super cool concept I think it it's is. a really great idea. Um, you know, it's called Roommate Room 8. Eight. <laughs> <laughs> Very clever. Uh, dad joke. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> hashtag dad joke, which good market for them. Uh, and yeah. it's designed for, you know, uh, short-term, multi-generation, a lot of people in the room, things like that. Uh, I, I don't remember all the specifics. You know, Lily, you could probably explain this better. But the, the idea being that, you know, we're reconfiguring the rooms to meet the needs of a different kind of traveler and put, you know, more right. people in the room because of kids or because of, you know, uh, millennials. or bec- And I, I shouldn't say millennials. That's not really true. Because of Gen Z, you know, college student level folks uh, who right. are a little bit younger and need someplace affordable. I think it's very in line with what Super 8 is and has always been, which is an economy. You know, my favorite campaign we ever ran at Super 8 when I worked for the company was was uh, we did this whole uh, very, very, like, um, uh, photojournalistic series of videos about all the places you go. You know, you're the gray-collar, you know, traveling salesperson. You're the family who's going to Disney and you're heading down, you know, uh, I-4 or you're heading down to, uh, uh, 
what do you call it, Florida from the East Coast or things along those lines, or you're taking your kids to college or whatever. And the, the whole campaign was basically, we know that we're not your destination. But wherever you're, wherever you are, between wherever you are and where you're going, there's a super eight, and we'll see you along the way. Right. Which I just thought was a perfect campaign. Because it's honest. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. they're not trying to be something that they're not. They're really, you know, it's authentic marketing. And this plays right into that, and I think it is brilliant from that perspective. Is it right for every business on this roommate model is going to be insane? Huge. Right. Yeah. Huge. But I think also, I don't think well, this is just your Gen Z or your millennial traveler. I think this is families because what really sure, sure. made me look at it is Absolutely. the shared common area. And frankly, that's why most hotels can't compete with yeah. Airbnb. So yeah. this is, to me, this concept is going directly after the Airbnb yeah, traveler, which is what made me think about it because they've got a shared room. They've got an apartment size fridge and microwave, which granted isn't a full kitchen, but it's a start. Um, and then they have a foosball table, cornhole boards. It's really built to be a shared room, but with privacy. You know, everybody went after the lobby, which is one way to tackle it. But if you want to have a shared space with your family and you don't want your kids running around the lobby causing havoc, you have something to keep them entertained here. And right. you can still be with them and you don't have to have right. them sitting on your bed watching TV all together. Like it's a comfortable living room style concept that yeah. I think is going to attract a lot of people away from Airbnb because, yep. you know, you've got a lot of reasons to use Airbnb. But let's be honest, one of them is price point. Oh, so for, for sure. super oh, eight, for sure. all this out at a comfortable price point yep. is something that well, it, it, it allows them to maximize the revenue of the footprint. Right. So they'll actually make more money overall while making it less money per person for, right. you know, the people who are looking at this, which is, uh, you know, super effective. But Wyndham has been onto this for a while. As you all oh, yeah. know, yeah. as yeah. a as a parent of young children, Wyndham Grand with their bunk bedrooms, they've mm-hmm. got me. Like, I absolutely yeah. love them. When I find a Wyndham Grand that has the bunk bedrooms, I'm, I'm all in. Like, you, you're not you getting do. me to stay anywhere else. Right. But Ed, Ed, I want to ask I want to ask you this specifically because you're a resident Orlando expert, our resident Florida expert. You know, I I we used to take our kids. And I worked for Wyndham at the time, and I'm probably going to get in some trouble for this with somebody. But uh, uh, <laughs> we used to take our kids to the Nickelodeon suites mm-hmm. all the time when we went to uh, Orlando, and I never got why more people didn't. Get on that concept. The family so, suites, yeah. Oh, uh, my God. We loved them. You know, so they weren't the best properties, but they were no. perfect for what our needs were. We were spending no, and you most definitely of our with the with the Nickelodeon, which took right. a $30 million room renovation to bring it up to the standard of a Holiday Inn. Um, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, like, the, the Wyndham Grand Bonnet Creek, which is very cool. Oh, I love Bonnet Creek, yeah. Um, you know, that is where we stay for Disney. Uh, we, because it's as close to the parks as Disney's own hotels to get there, yeah, right. but man, for 159 bucks or 199 bucks, you're staying in close to a Waldorf Astoria quality, um, right. in a room that has a, it, all they basically did was take a walk-in closet and pull the door off it, put two bunk beds and a small TV in it. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, right. Love it. Um, it's my favorite room type of there. So this makes sense. Like this is okay. How do you take that's the high end? Um, uh, and, and you know, don't be fooled by the price. Bonnet Creek for some reason does not do well. None of the hotels get the price point they should for the flag that they fly. Well, uh, it's because there's just too much. There's too many other options. Is right. Problem. I mean, the Waldorf yeah. Astoria yeah. Hilton complex there. Yeah. It's the cheapest people, Waldorf you could possibly right, stay at. Because right. people of will thing. trade. Because people will trade down. You know, there's there's right. enough other yeah. options that are okay right. enough, and well, you're going to spend your day at the and you're going to spend your day at the park anyway. Right. 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 So yeah. so you know, but you know, go elsewhere. We uh, the Wyndham Grand in Clearwater mm-hmm. has a, a bunk bed room that they actually partnered with the Clearwater Aquarium. So all the rooms are themed. To the dolphins from oh, the dolphin yeah. tail. Oh, that's cool. And when you buy the room, you get tickets to the Clearwater Aquarium. Um, my kids yeah. love it. It's it's why we went there. 
Um, so, you know, when you look at what Super 8's doing with the roommate model, they're answering that family traveler that, I'm sorry, lockouts with young kids, you know, mm-hmm. so adjoining rooms with a lockout mm-hmm. with young kids is mm-hmm. not a suitable solution. Right. That's right. Because right. they have a door that they can walk out of without you hearing it. Yeah, and right. that, right. that um, when you have kids under the age of 10, you don't want that. Yeah, which by, which and it, you know, way. mom and dad have to split split up, right? Right. One, takes one right. kid in this room, one takes so that they're chaperoned and all of that. Right, but right. you know, from a from a financials perspective, you know, designated revenue manager in the room, this makes me wonder, like, how can we face this challenge in revenue management? Because I'm pretty sure this is not the last concept we're going to see like this. They're just right. the front runners, right? It was designed by a college student, which frankly, if you haven't had a college student design something for you late, lately, you should probably do that because that's the wave of the future. They're in tune with what these travelers want, right? Like they're bringing the fresh ideas. They're not biased, but I digress. My point is there's this whole community. You're allowed to digress, now. by the way. That, right. that could actually be the, that could actually only, be the name of the show. Digress. But I digress. <laughs> but, uh, that's great. That's great. But I digress. digress. Um, <laughs> but, you know, really, you, how do you price it and when? And here is something that we probably need to really look at on the revenue management side of things. When do we start measuring by square feet and not by room key? Because right, technically, right. this could be considered one room key, theoretically, although I didn't see details on this. Theoretically, it has one entrance. Mm-hmm. So it's got multiple bedrooms, one a shared key. common yeah. area. It's one yeah. key. Yeah. So but it's a bay. I think it's a bay that? and a, it's technically, I believe, a bay and a half. I think. Right. But, so yeah, but that's not. Like that, from a real estate not, perspective, you know, price right, per right. square foot. We do that in catering space. But in yeah, yeah. Yeah. Although you have to be careful because if you go down that rabbit hole, you will no longer be able to justify spending on a pork cachet or a lobby, mm-hmm. which I mean, mm-hmm. by all hotel well, you've marketing, got your revenue generating and non revenue generating. And, and oh, hold on, hold on. I've, 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 I've <laughs> actually have a great story about this. We had a discussion years ago when I was at leading, we were meeting with somebody from a, uh, uh, a property. I won't, I won't out the property. And, um, uh, they were talking about how they maximized the yield of all the different spaces and how they took this office and turned it into a fitness center and all this other kind of stuff, you know. And the head of marketing for leading at the time said, who was very much a marketing, like, uh, you know, brand person, right? And she was wonderful, but she was definitely very, let's talk about brand, let's talk about experience, let's talk about all that. And, and she said, but what about the intangible value? And the guy with, without even breaking a stride, said, oh, that's simple. We pay for those with intangible dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you get a great ROI on those. You, oh, it's unbelievable. Well, well, you know, and, I think that there's I, these spaces all over hospitality, right? Because we have the same conversation when it comes to looking at a piece of group business. Does the group right, repeat? Right. What's the relationship factor? Is there a corporate account attached to this? So... I think that, you know, these, it, from a marketing perspective, a great port of share, great lobby, great <laughs> photography, first of all. I, I can't even begin to tell you when I get onto a website and three different room types have the exact same photo, how much right. it drives me insane. Um, but you've got to have those elements. elements. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I quote so, Robert all the time on that topic. I quote Robert, who was actually quoting, I think it's an Expedia person or it might have been Travelocity person back in the day. Uh, but I quote Robert constantly, uh, who uh, who said, "Pretty pictures sell hotels." Oh, for sure. Right. So, Why do you think hotels are selling on Instagram? Right. Exactly. Now, I do have I do have a couple of quick points. You know, Lily, the one thing I think a place where Super Eight has a huge advantage on this, and I'm not trying to knock Super Eight, but they don't tend to yield as aggressively as you know. Right. And this is not a, this is not a upscale property. And that's, you know, by definition, their yielding tends to be much more narrow to start Absolutely. with. So it's also easier for them to manage on that level because well, they just have to make sure they, they're in correct. need of an identity right. overhaul. That's exactly and right. This is a brilliant identity overhaul because this is how you will get someone who normally would not consider a Super exactly 8. Exactly right. To Absolutely. at least look and become aware of Super 8. This is how they can stand out 
Uh, this is also how they can put hope into their owner base. Uh, because here's the thing. I mean, if you look at, uh, let's look at another brand like this that has gone through a renaissance, which is G6, uh, yeah, Motel yeah. 6. Yeah. So it, the only way G6 was able to do it was Blackstone bought most of them. Right, right. Overhauled all of those right. to a point where they could say to the remaining owners, you, you don't have a choice. You right. have to right. do this. So, right. well, how do you do that with a Super 8? Well, because you're not going to go and buy them all. Right, right and right, and right. put in the, the investment uh, well, far from <laughs> right yeah. Yeah. so so how do you you have to go the other way you have to excite the owner base and get them feeling like there's a future that has upward mobility for them well and and, and this is the one of the points i wanted to make and I'm, I'm sorry for cutting you off but this was one of the key things i wanted to say you know people are very fond of saying in the hospitality industry that we're not an innovative industry and I think that that is a self, you know, creating a self perpetuating prophecy, right? This is innovative. It doesn't seem like it ought to be all that innovative, but I mean, for Christ's sakes, the heavenly bed was innovative once upon a time. And there's one in every freaking room in every property ever. That was, that was my favorite education. So I've never worked in a hotel, but I've been in the industry my entire adult life. Uh, and when I joined Starwood's, um, owner board, association yeah, yeah. Uh, to sit and listen how the most mundane detail of a hotel has someone burning to innovate it to hear yeah. Connie Kim talk about how she was innovating in linen design yeah. that not mm -hmm. only felt as good as high thread count sheets but uh, didn't require bleaching which right. meant it was better for the environment it was less expensive it was more durable because it was made out of bamboo right. um, to right. hear uh, you know, how uh, recycling receptacles has someone sitting there burning passion about how they're moving that forward to talk to the Bose rep about how Bose is helping hotels uh, design better spaces before they're even built by right. allowing them to pl plug the CAD design in name what materials it'll be built out of. And you can hear what that space will That's sound right. like. Um, you know, that, that was my favorite education I've had in this industry is that it is incredibly innovative. That's right. In every single mundane detail. When we, when we do it right. And it's right. this, and it's this thing of, and I know this is this week in hospitality, digital marketing. I know I've spent 25 years of my career in digital and also innovation is doesn't mean you built a new website. And innovation doesn't mean you launched an app. And innovation doesn't mean you had a chatbot, right? right? Stop thinking that innovation has to be about digital. This right. thing that room, Roommate is, Super 8 is doing with Roommate, this thing that, you know, Starwood did with the Heavenly Bed, the things that, you know, uh, God, we can probably- Embassy Suite. This. Embassy, Embassy Suite, suite can be remarkably innovative. Double tree with the cookies. Double tree with the yeah. cookies, totally. And then uh, to bring it back to Lily's question about how do you yield this and how do you price it and stuff like that. And then guess what? You get to charge whatever you want because you're differentiated from the guy across the street who's got yep. the exact same bed or the exact same you wallpaper. You have shed your same... anchors. Yeah, you have, you have, <laughs> exactly. You have done two things. You've done two things. One is you've identified who your customer, well, three things. You've identified who your customer is. Right. You've <laughs> understand why they're, why they're staying there Even and you've novel. created value <laughs> for them. Right. 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 Wow. Right. That We're supposed to do those pretty... things, Robert? Wait, <laughs> yeah. what? <laughs> well, you don't have to. I mean, you can just, you know, you can just raise your price arbitrarily because you, you know, that's, that will, you know, maximize stuff. It's it's yeah. my fa it's one of my favorite stories in the history of the industry, and it's I wish I I wish it was my story to tell, but I he heard Barry Sternlicht actually tell the story when they launched the Heavenly Bed. I was at a conference, uh, a uh, Forrester conference, as it happens, you know, when they launched the uh, Heavenly Bed, and he he told about he talked about the fact that they ran a study. And they showed people pictures of hotel rooms and asked them to identify the brand, and that these were Starwood brands. And the results came back, and they were worse than random chance. Like, people right. actively had to have been trying to come up with results this bad. <laughs> and then he hit us with yep. the punchline. And the punchline was they'd run the study using Starwood employees. Yep. The Starwood employees couldn't tell the brands apart. 
Right. <laughs> and he yeah. said, same with, the, same with the websites. Right. Right exactly. now, you do the thing with the websites. If you turn them black and white, you eliminate the branding. You eliminate the colors. That's exactly right. You will, you will under index. I guarantee. You know what? I think Hilton does a much better job talking about the room differential because there's been at least three different times where I've walked into a hotel room this year and said, Oh, this used to be a Hilton. Yeah. 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 And then right. looked it up and proved it because very, they very easily. A Hampton, a Hilton, all yep. of those. They had yep. very specific colors. They had specific materials in the bathrooms. Well, I can I identify a Hilton bathroom anywhere. Yeah, and they had different floor plans, like right. notably different floor plans. Yeah, actually, just because Robert brought it up a, a moment ago, it is actually a game my wife and I play of the properties we walk into and and, and we go, oh, what this used to be at Embassy Suites. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. well, specifically yeah. because of the atrium, right? right. I mean, yep. that's that's yeah. right. And the, the the interior exterior corridor, you know, like yep. that's the yep. you can tell away. any property that ever started as a holodome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. And I'm pretty sure that's fifty percent of Howard yeah. Johnson's <laughs> current like properties started life as a holodome. Oh, that's, 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 that's where you get a chance to actually differentiate and set the price right. that you want to. Um, you know, obviously yeah. there are limits and things like that, but you put yourself yeah. in a, such a better position. One of the articles that you put into Robert was the Oyo, the listings. I even having worked with Oyo did not realize that they had other brand levels above what I had been working with on their, their US ventures. And, and the oh, Indian, yeah. that one article that showed about all the different tiers, I didn't even know they had luxury ish, if not well, luxury. Well, they bought Hooters. Properties. They bought Hooters oh, that was the Vegas. Of that. But I mean, normally it was yeah. the lower end. If, and, and that's why I think the Super 8 thing is, is awesome too, is that, is that because they have to do something about this battle that's going on in this lower end of affordable travel right. uh, that, that they have to create these variations now. That I just gotta did. tell you, I mean, Red Lion, they have a concept that they haven't built much of, but where they're taking those exterior corridor, like old motels and making them super trendy and like cool looking. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah. want to see more of those because like that's Clearwater Beach, Florida is yeah. nothing but those motels. Right. And, you know, to have a brand uh, understand that the answer isn't just tear it down. It's make right. it cool. Give it a right. funky colored door and, you know, uh, lean into the design element of the, you know, the time period. And right. Uh, right. you'll you'll well, be able to differentiate it from the ones that are charging by an hour down the street. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, they've done a really good job of that in Scottsdale with the property. And Ed, if I'm not mistaken, it's the one that you and I met at, the Days Hotel in yes. Scottsdale. Yes, they that did a great job. Great. With that I project. did. I mean, I walked in there because uh, Ed presented at a meeting there for HSMAI. That's where we met. I walked in there after it converted to Hotel Adeline, and I could not place where I had been when it was the day's hotel, because it looked so dramatically different. And everybody, we've had some meetings there, you know, we've recommended it to some people and everybody loves it. Yeah. And it's very unusual to say like, oh, I love this two story exterior corridor hotel. Right. But you know what? But they did an excellent job. It's a phenomenal Uni property. Universal Studios built one from the ground right. up. It's called Cabana Bay. It is the coolest newer <laughs> hotel that we've had in the area and it is it's that building like right, right. It, it's yeah. super cool and the way the buildings all like over time got connected and how they added meeting space that adds character and so you know uh, you can differentiate yourself in the budget level uh by thinking just through design take the target approach right. cheap chic is a right. brilliant right. strategy. The, the Target approach. That's well, right. <laughs> well, and let me tell you, let me tell you, the RLH group, right, Red Lions, yeah, parent corporation. They certainly have opportunities now since they have Knights in and America's Best Value in, and those right. two brands, uh, yeah, could, need could use need some help. Radical, yeah. radical. <laughs> well, I know that I don't know about America's Best Value in, but I know the Net Promoter Score for Knights in is like minus twenty five. So, so generally yeah, where you want to start. Yeah. yeah, you know, this I, is a really like, interesting thing to go into in the potential recession too. Is you know, economy hotels are probably oh, going absolutely. to become really important to travelers who are looking to save money, but a lot of them have fallen out of favor, you know, with
travelers who are educated or travel for any, you know, decent amount of nights per year because of design, safety, and cleanliness concerns. So I think it's the perfect time for economy operators to embrace these design trends. Well, and and do a little clear, when we say economy, that no longer includes any of Hilton's brands, which right. used to right. have a stronghold right. in mid, right. mid, mid economy. Uh, right. But now all of those hotels have ADRs right. over 150 a night. Yeah. Uh, same product, no change. Uh, it doesn't include any of Marriott's brands. Uh, these are, right. you know, real economy. There's been this gap. You've either stayed where you are and kind of gone downhill or somehow you've taken what was economy and brought it up into that hundred plus dollar price point because your location was well, is, is worth it. And so you're, you know, and this is, this is the funny thing over time. I mean, uh, so my old business partner from easy yield, uh, you know, made his way as a road warrior for a, uh, a management company in his younger age. And he was one of the first people to take a Hampton Inn and get its ADR north of $100. And this was at a time that Hampton Inn's ADR ceiling was $89. Right, um, right. And now look, find me a Hampton Inn below $100 a night. Uh, you know, it's pretty tough to find. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, so so economy. I think there is a big opportunity there. I think Oyo is jumping on it. Red Lion's got the, they've got the makings to be able to do it. Uh, it's you just have to re realign, innovate, your innovate, and execute. Well, it's not just that. I mean, think about why like some went up market. It was so you could sell a crap ton of the franchises to real estate well, investment sure, trusts. Sure, sure. I mean, yeah. you know, but a real estate investment trust isn't going to invest in something that, that has that right. low of a rate. So these franchise companies that have gone that way now actually have to think about, wow, like real people own these properties, like they're small business people. They're, you know, this, it's a, it's a different person to deal with. Oh, without question. I mean, I, again, I grew up in the industry in that space, right? We, we owned Super 8. We owned Nights In. We owned Days In. We owned Howard Johnson. We owned Travelodge. Um, and they still do own all of those brands except for Nights In. Um, and, uh, you know, with, I, I rarely talk about Wyndham for all the reasons that I did. I, I've already stated, you know, but, but the, the truth of the matter is, and I think I can say this out loud, is Super 8 and Days In are 4,000 of the 9,000 properties. They are still an enormous contributor to the revenues and to the profitability of that business because they just have a lot of them, right? Um, Howard Johnson and Travelodge are another 1,000 properties or something like that and are functionally, a, you know, Functionally, I don't know that this is true today. It certainly was true when I was there. They were an East Coast and West Coast brand, right? It was Howard mm-hmm. Johnson was on the East Coast and, and Travelodge was on, or East of the Mississippi, West of the Mississippi. Um, and I think they're recession proof. I think, you know, if in fact we have a downturn or at least a slowing down, which certainly seems likely, uh, you know, they're somewhat recession proof. And these are the folks who become the great operators over time. Not every one of them, but it's where a lot of great operators have come from. They, they yeah. learn their craft. They learn their trade owning a 49 room, you know, $79 a night product. You learn a lot about how to be a good hotel operator or you don't make your note every month. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the number of folks who I know in the industry who started out with a Super 8 or a Travel Lodge or a Days In who now own 10 of them plus a couple of, you know, courtyards plus a couple of Hamptons plus, you know, is a non-trivial number of people. So it's it's an enormous opportunity for these brands and for these owners to get good at what they do again if, if mm-hmm. there is a softening, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very true. Well, also, I think the, the lower scale brands um, recognize. Robert, the- you're muted, by the way. Oh, sorry. There you if, go. if you can provide, if you can provide quality accommodation at affordable prices, that is the absolute bottom, you know, bottom line right. for it. Right. Because um, it is, and for groups like Super Eight, there aren't a lot of folks below them. Now, that's where Oyo's coming in, but Oyo is going to have huge. 
problems, right? They had amazing potential, but they've got the whole soft bank issue is, is one anchor around their neck and they're doing their, their tech stack. Well, three problems, I guess. I keep doing that today, too, and adding the third. There's a trailer. I'm trailer playing myself. Wait, they, they've today? Got tech, they, yeah, tech, <laughs> yeah, tech stack issues. And third, their satisfaction sucks, yeah. right? Yes. They've got to clean up their – it isn't just cheap and dumpy. They're, if they can take those under-invested, you know, fringe well, properties and make them cool and unique – and clean and well managed. Wow, that's a or huge lower, lower, impact lower the expectation of the customer. I mean, there's two well, ways no, that's, to fix that's fair, but the well, satisfaction. But, uh, but you know, the, one yeah. is the yeah, you know, but the problem the with that Ed, or lower. Yeah, and nah. the problem with that, I you might be being somewhat sarcastic. You I might am. be being somewhat serious. But the the problem with that, and again, this was something we very much learned at Wyndham. Um, Steve, Steve Renitsky, the CEO at the time, went on a huge quality initiative. Um, and the reason he went on a huge quality initiative, yes, it was for the guest, but realistically, it was for the owners. Because right. what happens is the good owners don't want to be associated with the brand, and then they would go and become right. a Hampton, or they would right. go and become right. a It's the same reason we have right. HOAs, yeah. right? And correct. Too many That's markets. A, it's the same right. idea. It's yeah. the same idea. So OEO has to deal with the quality thing, or the people who actually are clueful are going to bail. And then, right. they're and then you're left with what you didn't right. set out. To Correct. Do. <laughs> and right. it's exactly. got to be, and it's got to be clean. And the problem is if That's right. it's scratched or old, that equals dirty. Right. right. Well, so um, you've actually, got the, you're right about or those, but more it's a patina. Again, yeah. it's how you set yeah. expectations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you guys know this. Come on. What is the number one thing people notice when they walk into a room? The toilet. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Top picture taken on TripAdvisor, so I figured. It'd be sure, right. sure, but there's uh, the TV. Nope. The bed. Drape. Nope. The I mean, what's left the in ceiling, this room? The, walls, the, paint. the scent. Uh, oh, the scent. Yes. The oh, first thing me, people notice. You walk into a room and you're like, "Ho, ho, ho! Who let died me in tell here you, last week? Right. You got a real problem." Get out your bingo cards, J.D. Power, customer <laughs> satisfaction study. Yep. The whole scent, the, the big things that we were running around telling all the hotel companies about, A, the scent, and and then really B, being the qu overall quality of sleep, which is kind of the purpose of the hotel. <laughs> uh, right. yeah, those are right. huge, huge drivers for hotels. satisfaction. Yeah, it's yeah, where they yeah. leave their luggage while they're doing stuff. Yeah. And the, yeah. the reservation, the reservation process draw, drives about three to four percent of overall guest satisfaction, yeah. which is really crazy. And people will fight to the death about that. Oh, it's so important to go right, but this is a regression analysis. This it's is so what important the customers because they don't have are to talk telling to the us. owners about it. Right? Why yeah, it's right. About that yeah. Way. Well, but right. boy, the way it's but and again, what you want to do as a hotel owner and a hotel operator. To improve, you have to hit on the areas where there's opportunity for improvement. If everybody's performing at 99% and everybody's doing the same, you aren't going to be able to leap right. ahead. So at I, least I want to give an example so in case other, anyone other. here is like listening to this show thinking, oh, I'm going to go buy some Yankee candles and put them in all my rooms. Um, <laughs> you can go the wrong way with scents. And I'll give yeah. you a oh, perfect. Yeah, sure, sure, I will sure. give you the perfect. Uh, it's MGM's property at City Center, um, the high-end one. It's um, the one that had all the room automation first. Uh, gosh, I can't oh, think Aria. of it. Aria. Aria. So oh, yeah. I cannot yeah. stand spending more than three to five minutes anywhere in that property because <laughs> right. of how yep. strong the vanilla yeah, scent yeah, they yeah. Pop, yeah. pump yeah. into it. It makes me sick. Yeah. It, right. it like I feel nauseated the entire time I'm on that property and all the rooms smell like vanilla. Your clothes smell like vanilla after spending right. a few hours in that property, <laughs> you yeah. need to dial it back. Dial it back because to people who are sensitive to uh, right. perfumes, right. it's torture. Right. Uh, some linen, summer warm. breeze. Just <laughs> right. Yes, yeah, some strong, strong scent. Right, of course. 
Strong can. scent is usually a con, no matter which direction well, you're is. going. Yeah, exactly. Strong yeah. scent. You want to be mild scent. Yeah. So I mean, I've even sensitive to Febreze, which is just supposed oh, yeah. to be removing scent. Yeah, 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 yeah. We tried well, that yeah. once in, in on a couch, and I had to leave the room. I was mm-hmm. so offended by well, it. I'm going to... Yeah, since we're doing the bingo card game, I'm going to do a bingo card thing. I got into an argument with one of our brand managers in my time at Wyndham, uh, which, let's be fair, at the time, that was Sendent when this occurred. I'm not going to out the brand or the brand manager, but it's, Robert, what you just said about, you know, the, the booking experience and things like that is exactly right. Uh, this one brand was lagging the others uh, in the family, right? Um, they all had conversion rates that were comparable based on where their their locations were. Obviously, the more geographic distribution we had, the higher conversion rate we had because we got to say yes. But we shared the same booking engine across. And this person was complaining that, um, that you know, there were problems with the website that were causing people not to book. And we did a, we did a fairly comprehensive study. Uh, and I was able to go back in this, you know, argument and say, look, I hear everything you're saying. I said, the problem with your brand compared to all of the rest in our family of brands is not that people will not stay there. It is that people will never stay there twice. Because of the wet dogs. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They would book. They would book online at the same ratio as we would expect. You know, we were doing everything we could to drive new customers into the place. The thing is, we were running out of people to find who hadn't heard how awful it was. Yeah, <laughs> there's a certain <laughs> universe after a certain point. <laughs> I can only do yeah. so much. So, Stuart, being from uh, New Guinea, uh, which is your turnoffs? Uh, <laughs> wet carpet underneath the wall air unit or vanilla smell in the room? Which is which is Stewie's yeah. current turnoffs here? <laughs> yeah, odors get me every time. I'm not a big fan. Yeah, I'll tell you. You know, that's, one. that's one of it. And then the other, you know, there's the death by a thousand paper cuts that some of these older yeah. properties yeah. have. Uh, and I'll give you a perfect example. A brand, uh, it, I guess they're a pseudo brand because they're more of a management company <laughs> than a brand. Uh, but we work with all of their properties. And they recently bought um, two properties in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I took the family to one of them where the room was great. Like, yeah, was it old? Sure. You know, but the the, ro- the room was great. The view was amazing. But then the rest of the property was a death of a thousand paper cuts. Um, standing out by the pool, all of a sudden you get a ice cold drip of water hit you on the head because all the AC units are dripping down the side of the building and you can see the orange rust <laughs> from it and that water just hit you. Um, That's an old you know, school mister, Ed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, had it been air temperature, I think it would have been a, like less bad. The fact that it was ice cold yeah, made sure. you just like, what yeah. was that? Yeah. Um, you know, the um the elevators uh were a bit rickety. Um, you know, again, nothing wrong with them, but the ricketiness of them made them feel somewhat unsafe. Right. Uh, to where you read the elevator inspection card. Um, you know, and, and it was just a series of details that each one individually low cost to, to address like the elevator, even if you had to put some sound deadening material behind the wood panels and it would cut down the noise substantially. Um, you know, the, the dripping from the air conditioning units into a common area, like gutter system, if you have to, um, the, the ADA compliant, like pool lift thing. You put it in the worst possible place. It's where there's the least amount of traffic clearance. Put it on the other side right. and it makes that area. Like there was so many parts of the, the, the building that I looked at and was just like, man, like you're, you're so close. Uh, and I, I have a feeling that in this budget realm, uh, you know, OYO is going to be facing a lot of these properties aren't the silver bullet, you know, put a new bed in, right. you'll put a oh, new air no, conditioning no. unit in. It's going to be the death of a thousand paper cuts. It's, you know what? You can't put the 90th coat of paint on these walls. You got to scrape the walls back because they look yeah. so gross from 90 coats of paint that they've had. Um, and, and it's, it's convincing owners that that's a worthwhile uh, oh. endeavor. 
Well, and right. and this is a place, and I know I've told this story a ton of times on the show. I'm not going to tell the whole story, but just the, the concept, I say this a lot, of if you're experiencing any softness, cool. Use that to your advantage. Take some rooms out of service and fix them. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to fill them anyway, get them in better shape and do it on a rolling tear, basis. Tear the drop ceiling out. Just tear, right. tear the drop ceiling wow. out. But you don't but, have to do all the rooms in the property say, in one year. Spread it over three years and, you know. Right. But let's ask Lily from a revenue management perspective because you want to do that when you're kind of at high occupancy and you're performing well and things like, yeah. No, no, I'm saying, like no, that. I'm saying. I mean, you don't want to. Well, yeah, no. Well, no, but, yeah. Right. But, take but advantage again, of the softness. You can take advantage of the softness, but you also want to do that when you have money to do it, right? Well, it's not sure. like, oh, well, sure, the, of the, course, things are turned down. So, yeah, well, but there will be like pressure most from hotels, revenue management to, to not yes. do that, right? Oh, no, no, no. Defer, revenue defer. management always wants you to renovate your hotel. It makes our job easier. <laughs> um, and definitely a preventive maintenance program. Like, right. it still shocks me how many people don't have this it drives me insane but um i think that you know theoretically robert hotels are not operating on a cash basis accounting system so they don't necessarily need to make right. the cash in the month that they're you know making the investment right. um, but they do need to budget accordingly so that's something to look at for 2020 is you know think about this when you're looking at your soft periods and budget labor that's not necessarily based on your budget of rooms sold when you're looking at your PM program. And I think a lot of people forget to do that. I think they're, you know, looking at this accrual off of rooms sold, which is certainly appropriate to your day to day operation. But, you know, I almost kind of look at a PM program as a fixed cost. It's something you should be doing year round, no matter how uh, how wow. busy you are. So maybe you push it more to the soft periods, but then there's also the question of what impacts your revenue more. If you take, you know, one room out of service for two days in the middle of a busy period and you just do one or two rooms at a time, is that better if you're the type of hotel that runs at almost a hundred percent occupancy for six straight months mm -hmm. than waiting mm -hmm. right. six months to fix the issues in the room because it's mm -hmm. going to impact your review scores and really, right. I mean, that's where we're getting to see people are starting to realize that marketing and revenue management in many cases aren't any different from each other. I'm plugging things right. more into spreadsheets. You guys are plugging things more into images, you know, whatever the case may be. But <laughs> that one cannot exist without the other because right. revenue management funds marketing and marketing sure. backs up revenue management. So you really yeah. can't operate in a vacuum anymore they are the both they are the same discipline and they need to work together now there's I mean, a package not, they're you too, can buy they're from too fuel. small thing. there's a package you can buy from fuel that allows you to not have marketing uh <laughs> at all so that it's just revenue management what is that uh, oh it's wait popular, wait what are you talking about <laughs> no, no, wait, quiet, wait. Stuart, I had to work thought, you in. I thought you had the other fuel thing where Stuart comes in the French maid's outfit and cleans your hotel room. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very popular one that you have yeah. to schedule well in advance. Yeah, okay, and then so, you don't have to worry about revenue management because no guests want to okay. stay. <laughs> Listening to all the dialogue, I will go back to one thing. When you're passionate, people turn quiet. You should be concerned. This goes back to a story way back when I first started with the Ocean Properties, and I was at the Marriott owners conference and i was like oh this is awesome and i'm walking around and of course all the important people want to talk to and the important people well this young gentleman came up to me and he's like so what are you here for and we're talking and he's excited he he and his family were going to be having their first marriott they were going to they were going to decide to sign the marriott contract they were invited to this conference to become a part of the marriott family uh. okay so he uh, did all no bright eye, and you were the first person they, that he met. Yeah, I know. Sad, right? So, so anyway, uh, <laughs> independent, independent hotel now, huh? So, so <laughs> anyway, he's walking around trying to find out who's who and what's what, and he sees some important people. I'm not going to name them out. That yeah, you know, these you know, he's like, oh, I won't go say hi to him. And I was by them when he goes up and says hi, this and that, you know, and and and, and they said oh, okay, hi. And said, so, yeah, we were thinking about building a, a, and I think at the time it was a courtyard or something. Oh, good for you. And turned and kept on talking. Oh. Saw him at the IHG oh, conference. <laughs> yeah. Guess where they built was IHG hotels. They, that one moment, 
change their decision. Uh, they, yeah. boom. And as I, well it should. As well it should. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it, it leads me to, I'm really curious to see how things play out in the next five or 10 years for Marriott, to be completely honest, because with the acquisition of Starwood and they're still doing other acquisitions, you know, they're, they're trying to focus on vacation rentals in a way and they have all of these things going on, but there's a lot of unhappy operators out there right now because they don't feel heard, which is exactly the point. You know, they have, they have this kind of mandate out there about who you can and can't work with. They have so, so many rules. Marriott loves control. And there's, there's pros and cons to that, right? Because they don't suffer. Like nobody says, oh yeah, I went to this, you know, really dilapidated courtyard the other day. It doesn't happen to them nearly as often. And so there's pros to that for sure. But a lot of people feel like they're pushing the envelope too far in control and restricting competition within their own services or within the, the things that they can provide. And I've got to wonder, especially since now a lot of hotels are competing with other Marriott's in their markets, they can't even run a decent star report in many cases. They have to pick a fake comp set because there's too many Marriott rooms in their comp set. So at what point do operators say enough is enough and start either going independent or reflecting to a different brand because they just, it's untenuous. So when do you think one of these well, brands is going to take a stance that they will not franchise to REITs? <laughs> so the brand, the brand that actually answers the owners. You laugh about yeah. that, but actually in the restaurant world, um, franchises that require owner operator are way more prevalent yeah. than yeah, like, uh, absentee yeah. owner. I have a question. Yeah. I have a question. Does Magnuson allow REITs? I, you know, I don't know. I bet you Magnuson's already would. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. That would make sense. That would be my guess. You think they've outlawed? I don't think they would outlaw them. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, I don't but think I, they certainly aren't it that way. But yeah, they're certainly not going after them. operator requirement yeah. uh, right. wouldn't be yeah. unheard of. Well, Outback yeah, was yeah. the first in the field. Uh, that's Beth Best Western, too, and Magnus, probably. Uh, yeah. Best yeah. Western and Magnuson are probably the ones where that's, yeah. where it's, whether it's explicit or not, it's probably happening. Right. Mm. So, yeah. Well, I got a question for Lily. So, you've got Marriott in Manhattan, which has 90 properties, versus Hilton that has 13. Um, in a downturn, any issues for Marriott uh, figuring out how to uh, feed those well, guys? To be fair, Hilton <laughs> doesn't own a single one of those rooms. And no, neither right, does right, Marriott right, anymore. Right, neither does Marriott so either. Neither right. of them are going to feel the financial pinch of it until an upswing's coming when those right. hoteliers may be moving on from their flags. Yeah. Right. And so that's and all of them problem. In New York, they can go independent easily. Yeah. Right. Easily. yeah. yeah. And New York too, it's going to, you know, it's going to suffer a little bit less, just like we were talking about the markets that are going to suffer less with the whole brand USA, you know, yeah. situation. Yeah. Things are going to continue to some degree, although more price sensitive guests may look at other destinations. So there's that. But I don't know that it's a question of brand as much as it's a question of the penetration of scale in the market, because it's the same thing that we always see. Luxury starts playing in the upper upscale pricing. Upper upscale starts playing in upscale. Everybody shifts down one to two right. scales in their pricing. Right. And so the Sweet. properties that tend to suffer the most are your select service. And I think right, that right. with the proliferation of that scale across the entire U.S. recently, that that, that could be a and that may be your big issue for those. For yeah. brands. Because right. most of these brands, their growth is all select right. service. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. They, right. they only really like to talk about the stuff that is the really cool and pretty and you know, all of that. But in reality, the majority of their key growth is the select service. Yeah, but I'm going to say the negative part of this because the people who will actually suffer are not going to be the brands, right? The brands will take a hit. The people who will suffer are going to be the franchisees who don't make it. The owners. It, mm -hmm. Are the owners who don't make right. it. Let's be yeah. really fair about yeah, what's yeah. actually going to happen there. You're going to have folks who can't make their note and they're gonna they're right. gonna they're gonna default, oh, and, that's, and, then the, and then the banks that's, are gonna suffer. We can't have banks suffering. So here's <laughs> what I here's what I want to know though, and why I think this downturn might be different for hospitality than the last one, right? Like depending what it is that actually triggers the recession, if it's softening of the market, if we have a black swan event, nobody really knows what's going on right now. But 
I think that the the thing that will be different is that travel and experiences because of the millennial generation has become more more of Part of a requirement for this yeah. generation, like they're going to place even when they're broke. There, so yeah, maybe, yeah, they're going to place it. Oh my gosh, priority in their budget. So the walk away budget. point with this, so everyone understands this, is you don't have to worry about a downturn. The millennials gotcha. <laughs> Wouldn't that be ironic? <laughs> by, by, that the way, that be by the way, way. actually, there's like I it's think possible. That, you know, this well, whole, all the stories about millennials being broke. I think we're talking about a very specific subset of millennials there yeah, is they were the also ones that an are affluent the ones, millennial right well right. and they're the ones the ones who are broke are the same ones that created the stereotypical millennial oh for sure uh, and that yeah. that was like a gener it, it was inside the, it was a generation inside that generation it's a it's they're an modern age piece. right right right, right. I mean, lived with their it's parents. really no different not everybody right. who you know was in their 20s in the 60s or 70s was a hippie oh uh, wait tim were you a hippie <laughs> hey, hold up, hold up. You got the wrong guy. Robert, where you Robert, there you go. Remember, oh, I'm the generation yeah. here that nobody gives a crap about hey, because I'm so Gen I, X. I'm Gen X. Uh, Wait, hold I yeah. uh, oh you just are. You just make it in a cusp liar. That's right. You're yeah. a cusper, but you are Gen X for sure. I am. Uh, um, um, yeah, we're we the generation nobody gives a rat's ass about. When, um, when I was nine, I had a peace sign necklace. I was pretty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So first, I, I want to say I want to say two quick things, and I'm going to do my old uh, dialogue and dash because I have a I have to bolt at one. But uh, um, it's a George um, Costanza. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I. The, I always say, and I would love for, for this to catch on. I hate when people use the phrase millennials. I always talk about adults under forty. Like this is just they're grown ups, right. folks. At yeah. twenty three to twenty three to thirty eight, these are adults under forty. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but the second thing is, at least all the consensus, and I'm getting this from a variety of places, and I will get more next week. I won't be on next week's show, unfortunately, but uh, next week I will be at the conference board. Uh, I do a lot of work with them. Um, and I'll actually be sitting down with one of their economists who's studying what's going on, and I want to hear what he has to say relative to what I've been hearing from a lot of other folks. The consensus is that if we have if we have a recession, you know, first of all, <laughs> we have to we have to make a distinction between a, a recession and between growth slowing down. Right. You know, if you're still growing, yeah. you're not in a recession. It's just we may only get slower growth as opposed to a recession, and right. it might be. And it might be a lot slower growth. It might be 1% Yeah, you growth, may be a stall. Right, 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 right. right, right That's right. what I see right now. And that tends to be the consensus is that it is more likely we will stall than actually go into a recession. Right. But if we do go into an actual recession, it's going to be, uh, you know, a more traditional style rather than the 2008 or the, or the you know, 2001 right. A normal style. economic easing versus... Correct. Correct. A trigger-based event that right. set off a chain effect that crushed yeah. entire economies. Correct. Right. And well, historically in the hotel industry, and Robert is usually our resident historian, but historically in the hotel industry, when we have a recession, it's not a national thing. Right. It is mm -hmm. it is a market-based thing. So some markets will be get hit, you know, hard. Some markets will get hit. Some markets will actually be growing faster than the economy, and that's probably at least from everything I'm hearing and I'm trying to round, I'm literally working on a piece right now for my clients of rounding up all the stuff we can get our hands on. And that seems to be the consensus estimate. Could and well, there be, right. could there be a trigger based event? You know, could there be terrorism? Could the election, That's go weird? Sure. could, could sure. we have a civil war? Sure. Any of those are theoretically possible, but right. you know, but I mean, to, I heard it put best is it's more likely that the type of recession that we will experience will be the type that we don't recognize it happened until <laughs> we're almost out of it. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, right. That makes that's a great way to put it. Ed. Um, folks, I apologize. I have to. I have to bolt. Um, Mr. Tim, if people want to know what more about you, where is it they can find you, sir? 
Well, they can find everything they want to know about me at uh, flip2.to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, timpeter.com, uh, at tcpeter on Twitter, but uh, usually Tim Peter on everywhere else that matters. And if they want to find the contents of the Internet. <laughs> yes, the, the Tim Peter blog. <laughs> <laughs> slash internet. <laughs> there, there still is, by the way. I think it's still live. I probably need to go in and clean this up one of these days, but I'm pretty sure there still is a timpeter.com slash flip2. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, folks, it is always Thank a pleasure. Lily, Lily, I'm thrilled you're here. This was this was great. Looking forward to the ongoing dialogue. I will see you all in two weeks, but I am, right. uh, I am out next week. So uh, cheers, everybody. I'll see you soon. Thank you. I know. Yeah. Hey, just just we were talking about um, hotel price for the HSMAI um, marketing conference in uh, in January. Um, sorry, Marriott Marquis. I can't remember what the group rate is. It's like two ninety or so. I don't know. Two forty. Four star hotels in Times Square now selling seventy one dollars a night. For that, one. Uh, but here's and the thing: out how many? Those are mostly high gates, yeah. uh, and they're four star hotels. Yeah. Um, they're solid yeah. upper three star hotels that are calling themselves four star hotels, and for that price point, they're worth doing. Right. But they are, oh yeah, it's high gates collection of hotels. Like they own that entire area. I'm surprised they haven't well, taken over yeah. the market. You've got, you've got. I don't know if the Gallivant. I don't know if the Gallivant. That is, is a high gate. It is a high gate, yeah. So the Gallivant's in there. Yotel, Yotel's a little off the off the beaten path, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. But even Intercontinental Times Square is. Oh no, no, they're they're way up. Well, two ten them under opaque. Two ten a night, but under opaque. Oh, yeah, I bet I you it's sixty five bucks a night. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, Robert, yeah. you should pay it's the right. extra hundred plus bucks just to support so, the conference itself in the room. Yeah, box. right. That you doesn't have it. anything to do with supporting no, the conference. So, so <laughs> when did the digital marketing conference turn into the marketing conference? Was that this year's change? This year, yeah. But, yes. but they, they've got the tagline um, marketing in a digital world or something just to kind of transition. Yes. Just, just so no one gets confused and doesn't show up. Right. And, and Stuart, you said, I mean, you know, Robert's the old guard leaving, and you're the new guard coming in on this. I mean, you said yeah, you were on the advisory meeting. board. Yeah, yeah. You said that things went very well. You liked the segmentation of the board, and yeah, and how they're approaching yeah, they've things. basically broken it up into four work groups. So they've got a thought leadership group, which Bob is heading up. They've got um, Bob um, from HSMAI. From HSMAI. Um, cause there's a liaison from HSME on each of the groups, I guess. Mm. So he's, he's that, um, the actual chair is, um, Olga from Sendine. Um, I've not met her. She didn't make the retreat, but she's on that. I, I'm on that leadership, thought leadership group as well. And then we have, um, the CHDM group, which, you know, Holly's been on for, I think 400 years now. I mean, it's, mm. you know, she, Holly's not a day over 21, but she's been on that. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why it's good time yeah. management. That's it right. Is. And then they have a marketing subgroup, which is focusing on just the positioning and the, the communication side of, of HSMI. And then they have a conference specific conference group as well. Yeah. And they're, they're really evaluating. They're really trying to get into this concept of calling this like something like marketing week, because you've got a lot of things going on that, that week. You've got, you know, so the like CDM training, you've got the Adrian yeah. awards, you've got some round tables. Um, there's the resort round tables and I want to say the CMO round tables of that week as well as the conference. So yeah. really trying to blow it out. Mm. Yep. Do you make that Lily? Do you make it to the conference that the, the, the former Mark? I hope Mark so. Before? I was actually just looking at that, uh, this week and debating. We have, I've gotten January so many February great conference invites. It's Late January this year. Late yep. January 22nd, so. I think, or something. January yeah. I, I'd like to be there, um, because we are, doing a lot more with marketing. So it's the first year I'm kind of looking at possibly attending. But as we were saying about how important revenue management and marketing are to be together, it's definitely a higher on my priority list for conferences in 2020. Yeah. It's, it's always has one. Conference conference. being pretty solid always. Yeah. 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 And plus, we always cover it live. So if you do happen to join us or join the conference, um, we do a live coverage of it. So you want to know that part of the gang that you get to go over and hop on outside if you want to with us and recap some of the sessions that are going on and stuff. We put to a yeah. live in there. Yep. And, and if you do go, you can help me carry all the awards that feel <laughs> Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks so, from the Adrian's. 
Yeah, what, what, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the Adrian nah, Award. I, I, I'm going to brag a little bit. We've never entered the Adrians before because we've never really, you know, thought about much about um, award ceremonies in but general. you've hired we, a proper PR firm now. We, so you have we to hired a PR like firm, that. and one of the things they recommend is, like, you've got to go after some awards, if, you know, just to add to cute your credentials. So we're like, sure, we'll, we'll give it a shot. So we entered, um, I think, eight, and we ended up winning seven, including two gold. So – one of which was the Fuel Hotel Marketing Podcast. And now and, and, we, we are an award-winning podcast. Which is ah. kind of fun. Where can they find this podcast, Mr. Stewart? <laughs> oh, anywhere you want to look, really. FuelTravel.com slash podcast, Apple, Google, anywhere. Yeah. Really. You start Stewart, about just you know, hot tip on how to get platinum next year for the podcast. You have to claim yeah. that you burned $7 million. <laughs> uh, exactly. <laughs> well, so I checked this. So I got misinformation from Mr. Lauren Gray. So I, I was under the impression that it, they don't announce platinums until the actual awards show. And then Lauren wow. contradicted that and said, no, nah, they'll give you a little heads up. Yeah, they'll yeah. tell you because they want to yeah. make sure you're going to be there. They want to well, make sure you show no, up. Yeah. No. So Tim is on the board, on the group that actually selects the platinums. Yep. He's and, he's, the and he said, they will tell you you have a gold because you get a gold. But you right. may also get a platinum. That's decided Ooh, by selecting. They have changed. They select the platinums from the gold. Unless Stewart. Right. Oh wait, wait, Stewart. Unless that was the heads up. <laughs> well, maybe, uh, no, maybe, no, no, no. Uh, I know you know, I mean, him to ask him, and he was very gentleman. He been, said he was under an NDA, but he would consider this a friend DA with me, and he he gave me how the process works a little bit, but he right. would not divulge any. Information, so I'm none the wiser to whether to no, either no. of them. And I've, or platinum. Yeah. I've been a platinum platinum judge on that too, and so yeah, the process yeah, is yeah, you yeah. only you only look at the golds, right? Mm -hmm, so right. that's mm -hmm. that's the thing you you go through that, and then you do, and there's no limit on the number of platinums. You can have a lot of platinums. It kind of right. depends right. on as how long as there the, are enough. Big budget DMO spends enough <laughs> Hilton and Marriott <laughs> uh, campaign submitted. Um, and you know, maybe that is, squeeze in that something is, an OTA did. Honestly, uh, that is that show is me a platinum dressing. Yeah. Show me a platinum outside of those groups. Yeah. Hey, no, you no, know, back it, when I was I was back 12, 14 years ago, we actually had it where platinums were not announced and that we would tell people right. that you know, for the submission and then there would be a surprise at the conference. So uh, obviously, generationally, this has slowly changed in progress because we had to look at everybody to do a platinum. It was not you didn't get a gold and then went on. You literally were not told what you won right. until the event itself. Now, and the question will be, does Travel Click win a platinum this year because of the amount of uh, money they pump into HSMAI? Oh, see, you know, that's just not, not nice. Not really, I'm just no, curious. Cynic, I'm just curious. No, actually, I'm actually cynic. Actually, reveal the process. There were, at least when I did it, um, for the for the digital, you know, advertising and things like that. I can't remember. How, they they have PRs in one, and then it's kind of like digital yeah. and yeah. and uh, yeah. advertising. Yeah. But there were there were three of us, and at least my year, um, it was somebody from Google, somebody from USA yeah. Today, and me, right? Yeah. And and there was not really pressure from here's this, here's that. We really dug. And I, actually, I think we did a, a pretty good job on not, yeah, you know, putting thumbs here. on the scale for. Any, um, actually, it was Intercontinental for their um, video series with the um, – no, no, with the concierges, the local mm -hmm. concierges describing their local local um, areas, which were yeah. great. Their you know, video program is, is very early on. It was, it was good. Um, but, yeah, I think they do tip them off because they want them there to accept them. And so yeah. I think they kind of, I think that the process is if they haven't registered – then mm -hmm. they give them a little nudge, like you yeah. really will want to be there, type thing. Um, but yeah. if they do register, they're they're probably surprised, right? Well, I've so. already planned that I'm going to Kanye West this. Whoever wins a platinum, I'm going to jump up in front. Of that <laughs> is oh, a yes. great strategy. <laughs> 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 maybe yeah. that maybe that performance will win an award. Yeah, yeah. Right. it could be just that. It could be just that. Hijacking the Adrians, yeah, That's good marketing. So, yeah. If you get either, either that or a, or a Me Too suit, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't so, see that going down too long. Well. Robert's lives long enough to figure out if you had a favorite article that we didn't hit. Since we're oh, I want to talk about Google. Can we talk about Google? Yeah, I was yeah. going to say I'm also here yeah. to learn, so I'd love to hear your thoughts Bert. on the Bert update and the baby yeah. algorithms, which I had to look at, by the way, to make sure it wasn't actually about babies. 
that's, that's right. Just so, built yeah, by them. Yeah. What would you like? I'm going to go grab the clip. Um, the Bird update? Go ahead. Yeah, so Bert is basically Google getting even smarter, getting closer to Cyberdyne by the day. So Bert is is a yeah. part of the algorithm that, that looks bi-directionally at the string and really understands the semantics of what you're saying by yeah. looking at the context of every word and how it affects each word. So it just basically means that words that a year ago it would had a hard time interpreting because there's potentially confusion because words can mean different things. Now yeah. Google is really freaking smart about understanding. Right. This. I mean, and I love their example: yeah. how to fish for cow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How to yeah. cow, yeah. cow, yeah, cow fish great. when cow is a yeah. you know it's colloquialism for a type of bass, a striped bass, right? Um, so yeah. yeah, and and they literally showed the search results from before this update came out and after, and it was a before it return results about cows and after it returned um, results about fishing because it understood that fishing impacted the meaning of cow. Yeah, what cow means yeah. to fishing the versus bird yeah, like fishing. It's bi-directional cow. encoder transformation, what is it, um, representations trans- from transformers. So it's basically saying each word within yeah. their can Affects the other word. the meaning yep. of the other words. Um, and the really cool thing is Google's made this open source, so you can actually leverage this technology in whatever kind of um, system you have if you're doing some kind of semantic um, checking or, or, or trying to understand the context of people searching on your website or whatever it is. Um, but it's a big deal because it means that, you know, Google's getting further and further away from just focusing on keywords, and it's getting more and more focused on intent, intent. meaning, right? Intent. So, which means we can finally have websites that are written to be quality for the person reading them and, yeah, not, and not written for the game. game. Yeah. Not the Google Robot. bots. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it, and it parlays into this the, the baby algorithm thing. So, so that, that second right. article was talking about um, how, you know, not every vertical or type or grouping of keywords is treated the same way. The, the factors, the hundreds and hundreds of factors that go into what ranks where can be different depending on the keyword. So, you know, certain verticals, like if searching for hotels, they may look more favorably at site speed, for example, where, whereas you're looking for the answer to a question, site speed may not be quite as important, right? So it just basically means that right. the algorithm is tweaked based on what you're searching for. Now, I think I'm gonna push back on the article a little bit because the guy started out by saying um, that you shouldn't chase the algorithm, that a lot of people used to do that and that you know you could game it for a certain period of time, but it never lasted that a changes. long time, right? And now he's saying, so instead of chasing the algorithm, chase all the little different algorithms based on the vertical that you're going <laughs> on. On your vertical, yeah. Which I yeah. fundamentally disagree with, right? The, yes. the basic of SEO today is understanding the end game what Google's trying to accomplish, which is they're trying to match searcher intent, which they're understanding better because of Bert, good old Bert, with the best, most valuable, relevant content for that consumer. And right. So the relevant content further, that is served, that served efficiently right, and, and, and structured user well. Right. Right. Yeah, right. So this is with the best. This content. furthers the uh, the point for hoteliers to you know put more onus on high quality content. <laughs> yes. That serves the type of traveler you see. So if you are in Key West. Um, you know, writing blogs about different things where, you know, fishermen are going to be asking questions about the best places to go out and things like that. Being the answer there can actually get you positioned really well uh, yeah. to, to serve that fisherman and potentially house that fisherman. Yeah. Well, to me, I, I think the interpretation of this is being, to your point, Ed, about the content. It, it, it's going to declutter a lot of the sunny is 72 posts that go out there where you see businesses that they put content out that's only directed towards buy my product. I have a room. Here's a rate. Yeah. This is where we are. And it's, it's, it's all directed towards the, you know, buy and travel where if you put content related to what people are looking for, it's not so much the intended person is looking for travel. There's, uh, as I think there was in the news recently, they talked about the fact that more people dream about travel than they actually do travel. They don't even take their vacation days. Mm-hmm. So, right. you know, a lot of the discovery and interest level has nothing to do with me trying to find a hotel room, but it does have a lot to do with me finding information about places that I'm dreaming about or thinking about or aspirationally desiring. And if I can begin to get into that quantitative conversation with them as a, as a source of information by putting good content out, 
then that's really going to be the driving force. It's not about whether you discover my site for right keywords. It's that you discover my site because I happen to have the information you were interested in. Again, right. back to the user use. Yeah. So, yeah. It's that you're interesting and, and is valuable or helpful to you. You know, right. I think one of, one of the exercises we go through early on when we pick up a, an account on, on the SEO side, because it's a service we provide, um, is we start just listing all the questions they ever get asked on the, over the phone, in person, you know, if they have a search on their website, whatever's being typed in there, talking mm -hmm. to all the staff members and just figure out what are the questions, what are the blocks to people being able to make a decision with your property? What do they really care about? And then from there, you can kind of organize it and structure it and then start creating content that's actually valuable to people because it's answering the questions that they went to Google to type in. And, and ironically, yeah. if you want a really good example that's surprising, on this type of business's understanding and the importance of content is, uh, so not many people know, but I am a car nut. I love just all cars. I like researching cars that I'll never buy. I love cars. And uh, over the last couple of years, car dealerships have become incredible at producing video content that mm -hmm. deep dives into the nerdiest elements of the most mundane cars. And they, yep. and they produce them not as come here and buy, come and buy, come and buy. Uh, they're actually producing it as a way to, uh, you know, help people who are looking to buy a Toyota Prius and are comparing it to something else um, that are trying to understand the difference in model years and things like that. And they're great videos. And when you search a specific model of car, majority of the videos you will find are actually produced by car dealerships. Yeah. But they don't yeah. at all feel like they were produced by car dealerships. And I, I think it's a, it's a strategy to think about in your content marketing is, all right, so there are people who need education before making a purchase decision. There is value in helping educate those people about traveling with kids for the first time. You know, listen, living in Orlando, I can tell you there are so many people who have absolutely never been through a security line in the airport. So start producing content to educate people on how to de-stress yeah. that. Um, because I see it like they all come to Orlando, I think for their first vacation. Um, there are parts of travel that we're all professional travelers. We could come up with quality content that answers questions. And if you are making someone's life better, they will show interest in your business. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's sure. where a lot of, a lot of people fall short. You know, it's all about, you know, what do I want to tell them about me? But if you can tell them more about the destination through this type of marketing, you're going to reap the benefits of the businesses around you. I mean, even last week, I got an email about the top restaurants in the world, which unfortunately, out of the top like 25, only one was in the U.S. But for those who I know that we're broadcasting worldwide. So for those who are listening, you should look up that list. Because if you're in the vicinity of one of the best restaurants in the world, you better put something about that on your website right now, because now is when they're getting the hits. Now is when they're getting the traffic. Do something reciprocal with the restaurant if you can, so you can be on their website. But in the absence of that, start using the algorithm in order to tag yourself to that popular destination that's nearby you and drive more traffic to your own site. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good book. What are the demand drivers? Yeah, it, there's a really good book by Jay Bear called Utility. So Y O Utility. And mm -hmm. he talks a lot about, you know, the concept of helping, not selling. And he right. goes through a case study of a pool manufacturer, fiberglass pool manufacturer that almost went out of business. And they took the approach of let's just be helpful and answer every question people have ever had about fiberglass pools. And now they're the biggest fiberglass pool manufacturer and distributor and installer in the United States. And it all started by them saying, OK, how can we help people and start right. ranking better on search engines? And, and understand, I mean, so we're we're in an experiment that Stuart's uh, pretty aware of where we're playing with a part of the e-commerce funnel. Um, and we've taken a stance of no promotional messaging whatsoever in this part of the e-commerce funnel to see if you can accomplish what people think promotional messaging does. 
um, yeah. and actually be better. And, and we're finding one, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> B, um, there are anomalies that we don't understand. Uh, that I was actually talking to Stuart about it yesterday. We're seeing a higher spend per reservation uh, on the people who go through this path. And we didn't intend to do that. So we don't understand why it's happening. We're still working on it. Um, but, you know, you, you do need to challenge your thinking. It's not all about the, the quick hit. It's not all, oh, I only have two seconds with someone, so I have to tell them I will give them the cheapest rate or I, I'm here and stay with me because I'm the best. Uh, no, it, sometimes it's about conversation. And conversation Absolutely. doesn't get interrupted with. And, oh, by the way, if you're interested, I am screwing myself on rate next weekend. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, well, so and, and slide and in it's and it's a pop off and a pop under. And a, yeah. when I leave, right. But it's, understanding, right it's understanding the customer and their objectives. I mean, you got people, you're talking about Key West, right? I'm sure there are some people who go to Key West one year and then they go skiing in Aspen the next, you know, over the Christmas holidays or something like that, right? Right. And that's just their their pattern, right? right? And so you have to understand, you know, why are people here? And you can't just sell them, sell them, sell them. But that's a really good thing that if you're, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Aspen or Jackson Hole or Sun Valley, you're out there saying, hey, unbelievable snow conditions. Look at this. We're having a great season or how to do things, you know, new lifts or new this or new restaurants. Traveling is going on. Fees. You know, right. like yeah. this is the thing. whatever it may be, whatever destination you are, there are reasons people come there and there are people who are interested in those reasons, right? but right. aren't planning travel. So yeah. how right. do you engage the people who are interested in the thing? Take the fact that you know a lot about this stuff mm -hmm. because you're, a, you, you, if you grow up adjacent to something popular, you end up knowing a lot about it. I know a ton about doing the theme parks because I've lived here for so long. Uh, I worked at one of them for a while. Um, you know, you, you have so much expertise on things that people are interested in that is so before the travel plan. That right. if you win, then if you add value, all of a sudden, someone who's looking up a fishing lure and why one type of fishing lure is more effective than another on a specific species of fish, and you happen to be a hotel where that species of fish is where the best fishing is, answer the question about why the fishing lure is the better uh, solution over common thought. And all of a sudden, those people you know they're interested in that type of fishing. You're the you're building a relationship. Fishing, right. you're building a relationship. They're going to come stay with you. Right. Uh, or knowing the local outfitter who can get right. them to do that. Yeah. Or right. knowing yeah. the outfitter or the tackle shop or the bait shop, whatever it may be, just saying this is why people come here. This is the extra. And it may be a small niche. And, oh, maybe there is a little landing page on your site or there's a blog post that references that points to the landing page, which ties into one. Right. Yeah. And there's a really Those easy are... way if you don't know why people are coming to stay at your property, go have conversations with them. Talk <gasps> to them. Which no. Whoa. Whoa. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's revolutionary. What, what crazy this, talk. I mean, this is the kind of thing that could win a platinum award at the Adrian's, but uh. go have conversation with your guests it's no no best. no because Stuart, it's we don't guests. listen to to learn we listen to respond oh uh, that's yeah. right actually so we're responding manager, before we listen the a general time. manager needs to be at their desk on their phone looking talking to corporate team. or the regional person or looking at a spreadsheet they do not interact with those behind guests. the gatekeeper gonna, don't behind the gatekeeper they're yeah. going to come back and tell you things that are wrong that you're going to have to fix and be, yeah. no, your day is going to be so much worse. Just leave, yeah, let, leave that yeah. to somebody else. You're paying people to talk to those guys. Okay. <laughs> speaking, speaking of worse, the what row, I'm, I'm sorry, I got distracted because I didn't read the whole article. I read half of it. Oh, I read the whole article. It's I read the whole article and I'm like, really well oh, very oh. fine. fine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Lily. <laughs> The, the rut row this week uh, yes. was a uh, non-travel writer um, who got screwed, got totally grifted on an Airbnb scam and through just poking at it, actually realized it was like a massive like network. This is model. It's a yeah. business model. <laughs> sure. <laughs> kind of like, you know, buy me. 
$500 in gift cards and scratch off the number on the back. You know, right. that's a business model too. But yeah, absolutely. It's funny that that was included because uh, thankfully I read it yesterday because it's a very, very, very long piece. Super long. <laughs> about, yeah, you know, I, I, I could have it happened. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. But then yeah, I, I'm, I'm right. like, oh my God, it got big. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's really interesting because I this guy went to a, a lot of trouble to like track down other guests and whatnot. And I don't have that much time in my life, so I'm glad that they do. But I, a couple things I took out of that. Number one, be smart. Don't click on the link in the phishing email. Right. Don't buy gift cards and scratch off the back Correct. and don't accept a switch to your Airbnb via photos. Somebody sends you over text. Yeah, that's Although what I will say. I mean, mind. here's the funny thing. Uh, the one time I Airbnb was to set up a house in Clearwater for my whole family to go to. Like we needed a house. A hotel wasn't going to work. And it was a professionally managed property. And the property manager in a day shot me a note saying, hey, um, that property is not going to be available. The floors need to be ripped up. We right. need to move you. And I said, uh, that's against Airbnb's policy. So no. So, yeah. you know, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to walk away. Uh, and they said, okay, we understand. <laughs> and, and it's funny. I actually ended up booking another property from that property manager. <laughs> Uh, not knowing right. and that's, I mean, that actually happened to me in Nashville where, but it's clear, right? Like in, right. in the scenario of this article, it's supposedly some couple right. that is renting their home. And frankly, I'd be like, how many houses do you have in the area that you personally right. own? Right. Like, that's my first red flag. Second of all is uh, send me to the listing of this next one to look at it. Don't shoot me right. over a couple of photos. Right. I, I mean, there's all sorts of scams where people are renting out houses that they don't even own. Or, you right. know, it's not just Airbnb. It's also actual rentals. It happens a lot here in Phoenix where somebody go to the property. Somehow this person gains access to the property. They'll be shown the property, told they can move in their family. They sign a one year lease. They get there and it turns out somebody else already lives there and it has nothing to do with the person who showed it to them. It's, this is really no different. It's kind no. of a buyer beware situation and people have to realize that when they're booking on Airbnb, they're not dealing with Marriott and they're not mm -hmm. dealing with Hilton and there are no guarantees and it is up to you. Well, to and they're not dealing well. with, I mean, here's the thing. It doesn't have to be Marriott or Hilton. I mean, an independent hotel right. has laws they have to follow. Exactly. Right. And I mean, it, technically, Airbnb does too to some degree. No, but because actually as part of your agreement with Airbnb is you're agreeing that their final say on how it will be handled is right. acceptable and you will not sue right. them for that. Right. Um, right. You know, the, like this is the thing is, and, and you haven't watched this show long enough to know that I have been very anti-sharing economy uh, because it's, <laughs> <laughs> the whole label is a ruse. It's not sharing. It's not No, sharing. it's not sharing. It's how rich people are exploiting the middle and lower class people to do the things that give more money to the rich people. That's right. Airbnb. That's Uber. I mean, it's all these things is incredibly wealthy people taking advantage of middle America. Um, right. And so with that, it's not always just the initial target that gets taken advantage of. It's also the consumer of that that gets taken advantage of. And this is a case of that. This is someone who's wealthy, who had the ability to buy some dilapidated collections of buildings and throw crap furniture in them, realized that those buildings weren't marketing well, but most people, once they're on site, are just going to suck it up and not say a thing. And oh, by the way, if they stay one night, you can kick them out so that you don't even need to give them the, 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 the dilapidated building the whole time. <laughs> All right, let's kick them out the next day. Say that something else moved in, go find a hotel and you're never going to get your money back. So see ya. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. And so you have to understand Airbnb is still very much in the wild west in many locations. They are completely oh, for sure. facilitating breaking the law. And so when you do business with a business that is facilitating breaking the law, you're likely to end up in a situation that is less than friendly for you.
Mm-hmm. Well, okay. I wouldn't say likely. Well, you're probably. I said less than friendly. I didn't say you were going to get screwed. I said you were right. likely to end no, up no. in a situation vast, that's less than friendly. The it's vast majority. But the vast majority of Airbnb customers um, have a great experience with a outrageously high, like a their net promoter score is like 94 to 96. Are you sure right? that's People, not just because they're afraid that there's yeah. going to be retaliation no. if they right. get No, no, no. When you do completely, when you do independent, independent no, net no, promoter I'm just, score I'm, separate. Separate yeah. from, right? I mean, the no, one no, thing I, I didn't but, understand was But you have a lot of risk with the bad players, and that's bad for Airbnb, right? Yeah. And right. they started off with that, and they made some very, very smart management decisions, what they they need to do, and they need to get serious about it. And certainly, I, I don't know if it impacts their IPO or not, right? But that that would be an interesting dynamic if the investors really care. But they really need to figure out – they're, they're – they're getting better about the paying the taxes. I mean, that's really kind of on the well, level because, of the Well, because it's be better about the paying. Yeah. They're they eventually will. gonna have to pay all of them. Yeah. And they that's know the that. They're right. not doing this Absolutely. out of business. They, know that. Out of, they gotta clean up their act yeah. if they're gonna go out. And and right. they need to and they need to look at all these people who are individuals who have multiple listings and all these things who are running pseudo distributed hotels, right? Yep. And that sort of thing. They've got to crack down on all that stuff. But that, I, I don't know what the latest air DNA numbers are, but you know, in some markets, those guys are prevalent, right? They're, they've got 40% of the inventory or something like that. It's just crazy. And that's the problem with the, with that Airbnb, you know, the, the top story. Yeah. How do you crack down on that in that nuanced way? And Airbnb is not going to do it themselves, right? It's got to be some sort of, it's just like, you know, the political advertising, right? Twitter this week decided they aren't going to take political ads. Which is probably Dorsey most really wanting strategy. Oh, mess with Zuck, right? No, That's it's not just thing. that. It's get to step aside because here's the thing. Yeah. Twitter now will not be brought to Congress for any of this right. crap. Absolutely. And yep. the politicians aren't going to sue Twitter for right. not doing political advertising because it completely neuters their ability to go after Zuck and Google and all right. of that for the things they don't like about being able to dump money targeted against people who can swing the vote. Um, so no, it was brilliant. He put himself on the sideline on a no win situation. And now he doesn't have to burn cash. He doesn't have to burn. That's right. And- <laughs> and Twitter's and Twitter's revenues are about five billion, and Facebooks are like, or maybe three, four billion, maybe, and Facebooks are like close to sixty billion, right? Yeah. And and all of them are, you know, ninety three percent ad, you know, ad source right. in terms of their yeah. their revenue. So this is a much bigger problem and pressure on to. Uh, it's actually the Facebook. first truly strong strategic decision that I have seen Twitter make. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. I mean, yep. you can play Twitter for a lot of stuff, gosh knows. But this was probably one of the first things saying, yep, I'm out of this one. Yep. <laughs> well, and more importantly, he worded it so right that he can't be sued by the politicians. He's saying if your right. political message is strong enough, it will gain an organic reach right. um, that it earned. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so no talk, so you need your, you just need want your, your money. Puppet. You need your sock puppet accounts, you know, doing, you know, all these, uh, which grows you, you know, grow. fake news okay. story. Yeah. And that's, that's what you do to get the, get the organic traffic. Okay. That's since we kind of talked over Lily a little bit because she's not used to having to pry her way into some of our conversations. <laughs> 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 Lily, you were mentioning something. Please finish what you were mentioning. <laughs> you know, I was so interested in what you were saying. I don't even remember, to be completely honest. <laughs> Robert has that ability. He's captivating like that. And don't, don't worry. If I have a strong opinion, I will just speak over you. It's all good. This was a minor opinion, which has clearly already left my brain. So, I, uh, I was talking to everybody when I mentioned that you were, you were wanting to come join us. They said, they said, would you, you know, I think Eddie, you were the best one that made the point of is like, she does realize that being a guest host versus being a regular host turns into a <laughs> conversation. 
<laughs> you know what? I did my homework. I've watched the past episodes. I I know what the show is about. We're safe, yeah. but you know, I really felt it was important that we add just a little diversity to this group. Oh, yes. Yes. So yes. we've I tried know, the token, the token woman, and we the token have tried. Millennial, so there you go. Yeah, nice. yeah. We've tried to add women, but. They just don't want to hang out with us. We've just, well, it's, a, it's a lot like high school all over again, you know. I mean, frankly, all of us are surprised that someone married us. So. Yeah, really. <laughs> we, exactly. We're like, okay. Well, um, really, though, know, because you're in marketing, does this make you any different than the general male population, or are you just more honest about who you are? Right. We're true to ourselves. But the yeah. uh, I, 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 I'm actually scared of the the show that we are coming up on the 13th, where Stephanie will come back, Stephanie Smith. Your your of course will be here. Holly will be here. I would I would I would cringe at the idea if Valen actually showed in at the same time we kicked out Robert. Um, if Valen showed up. And if, uh, yeah, because uh, it'll actually be a good show. Oh my gosh, you'll be like, <laughs> because I just sit back and be the peanut gallery at that point. We're like, oh, okay, good. <laughs> well, um, the other thing is, Stephanie and Holly and I all like each other. So it's hard to uh, say if it will just be like uh, too much love in the room or I, if we'll actually, you know, argue with each other oh, for no, sales. No, no, because we'll we'll because we'll here's the thing, thing understand. All of us really like each other. We actually speak to each other <laughs> multiple times a week. Oh, um, yeah, I know, but we're setting up this particular show, right? As right. we're talking about sales, marketing, and revenue, and how right now they're still kind of siloed and at odds in a lot of yeah. cases. And so I think a lot, a lot of people will be tuning in, kind of expecting a little bit of a, a death match between these three disciplines. Yeah. And we'll uh, be in there reality, yeah. with the Barkers as the uh, the Barkers like, come on, you're going to let her right. say it? Yes. You guys are going to have to be the instigators <laughs> and, you know, throw Get in the there. Barkers. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Robert left, so I guess I get to do his closing thing. Is If you want to know anything about the internet, go to his Twitter campaign. on. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Follow Rock Cheetah on Twitter if you yeah. want to flood your phone to the point that it will crash yeah. because of the amount of <laughs> notifications. Yeah, yeah, because he, he he ties a lot of stuff to it. But uh, if you want to see Robert as a human being, his Facebook follow is pretty strong. He's uh, he's quite the family guy. Uh, yeah. Does a lot of interesting uh -oh. concerts with the kids. Um, yeah, it's yeah. a it's, uh -oh. a, it's a I drop off his, and all uh, of a sudden they're talking about me. His <laughs> Twitter, his Twitter, you know the rule. His uh, we thought his, you died. This is your eulogy. Yeah. <laughs> I was, and you missed all the negative stuff. I was defending you. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was all the positive yeah. stuff too. No, no. Yeah. He, he's a pretty stupid, but he talks a lot. Yeah. So. No, that's my, no, 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 no. You can't take that from me, Robert. <laughs> no, actually, Robert is, is quite humorous, very dry sense of humor. And the letter that, that, that he sends out, uh, the curated list and so forth, uh, Will always make you smile before you look at the content pieces because he has a great wit. Which, by the way, I'm, uh, Stuart, we got to make sure stays in, at infinitum that you have to assume that mantle of shared distribution on the board, uh, on the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the board, yeah, the marketing board, keeping the new name to make sure that they get the same list and so forth. I'm going to check with Julie. She just called me in the middle of the show. I got to call her back because I'm doing some video work for her. Yeah, uh, but I, I, assume, sure. I mean, I think everyone likes it, so I would assume Robert would continue to. Yeah, I think this. I've got to, I've got to make put that on. I've got to change it a little bit so people's, um, like I always just published everybody's emails. Yeah, you probably need board, to be right? yeah, I got to do some of that. Yeah, I got to yeah, go I mean, I do all that. On the, so. you see, and 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 Lily, by all means, as you get, they, we said, we talk to each other all week in different things and so forth. Any ideas for topics, information, things you think we don't want to make sure we miss or anything, shoot them over to Robert so they definitely get included to it. But definitely, you know, you'll see the dialogue as we go each week. It's a lot of fun. We can't keep up with it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I got a suggestion for one in uh, mid-May. Yeah. That was exactly. it. There's a was lot it. of really contributing. Uh, fair, yeah. Last <laughs> week, yes. I put in a suggested oh, article and it did not oh, yeah, the, the list. Yeah. And I did as well. I did as well. Oh, it's a uh -oh. Uh oh, this is an Airbnb level well, conspiracy. Well, hopefully, hopefully, in about two weeks, because I'm going to miss next week. I'm actually going to the Fast Company Innovation Festival in New York City next Ooh. week. So hopefully, it's my first time there, but hopefully there will be some good content. And if so, I'm happy to bring back some 
some tidbits to discuss in two weeks. Well, so if you're going to do that now in two weeks, we're going to have to use the new platform, right, Lauren? Uh, potentially it'll be up and running by then. Yeah, hopefully next oh, week. Wait, I- here's what would be awesome. Man. Potentially. We could really potentially. do something cool. While you're out there, do a, a recorded remote from the Fast Company that we can then discuss after, and we'll show the video on the live show, and then we'll talk about your points. Yeah, for sure. How do you want me mm-hmm. to record that? Um, Any particular platform? I would just use, I mean, use your phone and send it to Lauren just in case. Um, But I think that would be cool because that new platform sharing functionality was much better than this one's. Um, And it allowed us to all still be little cells around the sharing. So we could be like the, uh, the talking heads uh, on Mystery, TV, test, right? it's a Mystery Science Theater 2000. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I'll be so, you can, so you can enter up to be live and in the video at Correct. the same time. Yeah. Okay, yes. right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, no, Lily, I think the production values are increasing. I think you need to hire a New York City film crew. Okay, and, I'll you know, right maybe on that. We, we want at least two or three cameras, different angles. Yeah, it'd really be pretty. You, you know, need a key grip. Maybe a steady, a steady cam, something like that boy. would be really good. Yes, yeah. and a best boy. Yeah, and a best boy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, since you are the representative uh, female of the group today, you get to go first as to if people want to know more about what you uh, do and who you are, where is it they can find you, Lily? They can find me at tcrmservices.com. And I am the CEO of Total Customized Revenue Management. We do revenue management consulting for the hospitality industry. Mr. Roberts, since we were talking bad about you, which is the rule when you're not here. um, Yeah, I'll have to play that back. (laughs) (laughs) I <laughs> <laughs> deny you? everything anyone's ever said about me. <laughs> so, so that's uh, probably a good, a good <laughs> personal policy. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, rockcheetah.com or Robert K. Cole. And all I do is I, the only thing I now do is prepare a list of news topics for this show that do not get covered generally. But we did get to a couple today. So, <laughs> and uh, Mr. Stewart, who couldn't get, I couldn't get a word in edgewise because you're talking so much today. But I mean, you know, thanks well, for hearing. You know, me. I stay out of the conversations where I'm not that knowledgeable. Unlike Ed, who's going to have an opinion on everything. I, uh, can you get into the brand stuff? You know, I listen and learn, and I, I, you know, I genuinely enjoy it, but I don't have a lot to contribute. So I'd rather not talk, just to talk. So it was and good. it was Halloween. It was Halloween last night, and so he's a bit hungover. And, oh. yeah. and he dressed up as a platinum award because he has hopes and aspirations. So my dumbass eleven-year-old son decided at six thirty last night, as we were beginning trick or treating, as his hat flew off the golf cart to jump off of a moving golf cart and broke oh, his no. arm. So I spent oh, no. a good hour at the urgent care getting his arm put in a splint because he's Upper fractured or lower. his, his radius. <laughs> uh, he, he fractured his radius. It's a compression He's, a, he's a normal kid, Lauren. Oh, man. That, that yeah. is a good so, life lesson. Those things, hey, yeah, every childhood was, injury that helped him, helped him in later life. So Yeah, I, it could have been his head, so we were very thankful. Literally, we were in and out of the urgent care within under an hour, and we came back to trick-or-treating. And so by that time, he'd shed his full costume, just had a mask on and a sling, and would go up to people, and they'd say, is your sling part of the costume? To which he'd say, no, about 90 minutes ago, I fell off a golf cart and fractured my arm. And so through sympathy, they gave him handfuls and handfuls of candy. So he made out like a bandit last night. He got way more candy than he's ever gotten before. Sure, yeah, <laughs> this wasn't part of the plan all along. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe he's a genius. He's Very put his body on the line for candy, so I don't blame <laughs> him. But, well, you know, Stuart, I always opinion. wondered how they celebrate Halloween in New Guinea, so I appreciate <laughs> the education. No, 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 it's New Zealand. He's from New Zealand. Oh, oh, oh. oh uh, <laughs> or New Caledonia. Oh, wow. New Caledonia, I'm sorry. Barbuda. It's Barbuda, guys. Come on, you're so insensitive. <laughs> Really? Mr. Stewart, really, the really soon to be platinum award winning podcast. Where is it? Where can they find the yeah, soon to be winning podcast? The old Adrian award winning podcast can be found at fueltravel.com slash podcast or just search for hotel marketing podcast anywhere you want to and you'll probably find it. So, yeah. Probably. And the mothership if you want to learn about fuel is fueltravel.com. You've got all the information you can want there. Oh, and we just added a download section. So if you go to fueltravel.com slash downloads, you can get all of our past because we do travel studies and a technology study and we've done some white papers and whatnot. So all of those now aggregated under fueltravel.com slash downloads. Excellent. Yeah. 
By the way, uh, kudos on your graphic your podcast now. Great move. Great to be here. Stuart and I had a little jam session earlier in the week about him uh, introducing a soundboard to introduce clip. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell him, tell him the clip that we're going to record you. I built a better mousetrap. <laughs> we're going to talk about new innovations. And <laughs> oh, we're going to have a segment on the show, and it's going to be Ed's voice saying that. <laughs> so, Mr. Ed, where can they find you and everything about Flip2? Well, if you want to learn about Flip2, fortunately, and thank you, Stuart, uh, you can generally hear a lot about us on the Fuel podcast. Um, <laughs> that's how quite a few people uh, learn about us. Uh, you can go to flip.to, uh, social media, Flip2. Uh, you can learn about me on social media, Edward St. Ange. I have now separated my college football persona from my professional so you don't have to be barraged with that, that. Oh. Used to have lots of games. Oh. is that what happened no actually <laughs> exactly. i did it, I did it last season wagon. um <laughs> okay yeah last season i separated it because i realized it was time uh because i post <laughs> way more college football than i do yeah. flip to um yeah. but yes yeah, so you can learn about me on social media edward st Ange and mr lauren gray if people want to learn about you and all the new and interesting things you try. We'll go to Instagram with Lauren Gray, that's for sure, because the she looks a lot better than I do. Um, you can currently still go to hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live for this and all previous 220 episodes. For now, we are going to be changing it to its own separate website soon enough. With a um, longer URL. Well, no, yes. Yeah, so it's going to have to be a long string URL. Ah. <sighs> No, <laughs> I, think, anyway, I no, finally everything else. Uh, you can find it uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube and simulcast, and this is going to get posted on Instagram TV. We actually had an audience on Instagram TV. I was surprised since it, uh, Stuart is such not a fan of Instagram TV. It was probably Jennifer Aniston now that she's on Instagram. That's probably who was watching. That's probably what probably it is. Watching. Or they must have thought it was the other Lauren Gray on Instagram, and they. Scurried over exactly. thinking they're going to see a video yeah, of this yeah. 17-year-old music sensation, and they saw us, and 